Hey, once again from Bethel Baptist Church, Pastor Ed here with the Word of God, and we're going to start with a hymn, Victory in Jesus, Victory in Jesus. So the message of today is going to be about victory in our everyday lives, and we're going to sing from 243, Victory in Jesus in the New Hymn Book. Father, thank you for the opportunity once again to handle the Word of God. May we not do it deceitfully nor arrest it to our own destruction. May it be as pure and as powerful to our hearts today as it was when you first gave it. Glorify yourself in the Word of God, this message. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, victory in Jesus. I heard an old, old story How a Savior came from glory how he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about his groaning, of his precious blood's atoning, that I repented of my sins and won the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. Amen. He loved me and I knew him and all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about his healing, of his cleansing power revealing, how he made the lame to walk again, and caused the blind to see. And then I cried, dear Jesus, come and heal my broken spirit. And somehow Jesus came and brought to me the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about a mansion he has built for me in glory. And I heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea about the angels singing and the old redemption story and some sweet day i'll sing up there the song of victory amen oh victory in jesus my savior forever he sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. Amen. <clears throat> That's a rousing hymn. Uh, we ought to always be encouraged to live victoriously uh, after we've been saved, washed in the blood of Jesus Christ, our sins forgiven. And uh, too many times Christians make excuses for their sin. They make excuses for uh, holding on to the former lusts of the heart, lusts of the flesh. And because of that, they don't live every day in victory. They're often uh, snared uh, by their temp the temptations that are in the world. And uh, we have to admit that the temptations are very, very strong out there in the world because uh, of electronics now and uh, being able to get things done in, in, through media. And uh, it's a troublesome time for, to, for Christians to walk in the spirit and not fulfill the lust of their flesh. And so we're going to look at some things in the message today about living for the victory. And this is an expectation of God. 
And you'll see as we un, uh, unfold the message with you today. We're going to start in 1 Corinthians 15. I want to read three verses before we get into the message. 1 Corinthians 15, 57. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, and Romans chapter 8, verse 37. And we'll be quoting uh, other verses as we go along. But uh, right now, we're going to ask God to bless his word. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that it is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and the joints and the marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of our heart. Boy, I'll tell you, the Word of God does do that. So we ask you, Father, to uh, bless the time we're spending together today around the Word of God. May the Holy Spirit direct our hearts into the truth and help us to walk in it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, 1 Corinthians 15, 57. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. All right, it's not by power, it's not by might, through myself, through my flesh. It's through the Spirit of God, and He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. Now thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ and make it manifest the savor of His knowledge by us in every place. So the Lord God Almighty, He causes us to triumph in Christ. So all of these things are put in place the, the moment we trust Jesus Christ as our personal Savior and we are born again by the Spirit of God, all this power is available to us to overcome the sins that we struggled with and that brought us to Christ in the first place and before we repented and believed on the Lord. Romans 8.37 says, Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors, through him that loved us. And of course, no one loved us like the Lord did for what he's done for us. So we can get the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. We can triumph in Christ. And we are more than conquerors through Christ. That sounds like victory to me. Do we ever go into a game uh, in a sports uh, manner? Uh, uh, baseball, football, basketball, whatever, whatever your choice may be, with the intention of losing? You know, when we come to Jesus Christ in the first place, why did we come to him? Just so we can say, well, I'm going to heaven? Well, well, that's not walking in victory, that you're expecting to live your life the way you choose from the time you got saved to the time you go to be with the Lord, and that you're going to be uh, brought right in and and just because you said some words uh, asking Jesus into your heart or into your life, listen, your life was lousy before you got saved. You, your life was worthless before you got saved. You might have been a nice person and uh, did nice things for people, but in God's eyes, you were dead. I was dead in trespasses and sins. And I needed new life. I needed I needed Christ's life because he's risen from the grave and his life is eternal. And so God offers that free gift of eternal life and forgiveness of sins when we trust in Christ, but the expectation is we're going to begin to live in Christ, to walk in the truth of the Word of God. And many, many Christians, many who attend churches, uh, people who call themselves Christians, people who are actually born again, uh, people who are just church attenders, and they, you know, they just figure I'm going to make a few points with God by showing up and uh, throwing a couple bucks in the offering plate, and, and, uh, and my, my hands are clean, and I'm okay with God. Or maybe you go to the confessional, and you confess your sins to some man who's just as simple as you are. Uh, whatever your choice may be, that's not what God wants. He wants you to repent in your heart, turn to him by faith, read the word of God, and take what's applied to the believing person and live that out as best you can. And to get victory, get victory. All right, so we're going to look at some other things here. When we read through the Bible, and particularly the New Testament, uh, there's something that becomes very obvious and clear. The scriptures anticipate that believers will live a life of complete victory for all of us 
according to the instructions that God has given us in the word. The Lord expects nothing less from his children, uh, nothing less than triumph for, for every born-again Christian. Philippians chapter 1 and verse number 6. If I'm going too fast for you, just jot down the reference verse. You can look it up later. Philippians 1 verse 6 is, says this, Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Now, he that began a good work in you is God. And that good work is when you repented toward God and, and, and had faith toward the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, you trusted that what Jesus did for you is what's necessary for you to be saved, not what you do for God. And so at that time, at that moment, when you, when you repented and you trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, God made you his child. You weren't a child of God before that time, no matter how many days you spent in church. So God saves the soul uh, when we repent and believe on him. Now, these verses reveal to everybody who are trusting, already trusting in the saving work of the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation, that the good work he's performing is not a one-time cleansing uh, that made eternal life possible, but it also includes a lifetime, a whole lifetime of continuous outworking of that salvation which enables the believer to live life more abundantly Colossians chapter 2 verse number 9 for in him Jesus Christ dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily and ye are complete in him which is the head of all principality and power we understand now through reading the scriptures that uh, in Jesus Christ is the fullness of the Godhead, the Father, the Son, the Spirit. And these three are one. And because of the power that he has from the resurrection of, from the grave, resurrection unto eternal life from the dead, uh, we, we are complete in him. We need nothing else. Uh, when we trust in him, he seals us until the day of redemption. He, he directs our path. We're the problem. When we, after we get saved, we're the problem before we get saved, we're the problem after we get saved. God's word is true, and God expects us to follow his truth and to live in his truth and to let that truth live in us. And we're looking at these things and we're saying, well, how come I'm struggling with sin? Well, that's because of your flesh. You, you desire the old life. You desire to continue on in the things that you used to do. If you uh, were an alcoholic before you got saved, you're going to desire alcohol. But God will take that away from you if you will yield to him. If you were a, uh, a lustful person, God can take away your lust from you, but you have to be obedient to the word of God for that to happen. So no matter what sins we lived in beforehand, before we got saved, after we get saved, God gives us the power to overcome all of those things. Colossians chapter 2, verse number 18 says, Let no man, I don't care whether he's a preacher, whether he's a, a priest, whether he's a rabbi, or just you know your friend or your, your parent, whatever it may be, let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worship, worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. And 2 John chapter 1, verse 8 says, Look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. So the scriptures teach us a very strong lesson that all we need for total victory and for the fullest possible reward at the judgment seat of Christ for believers is already provided for every saved man and every saved woman. At the moment of our regeneration into the new life, we are given the complete package of everything that we need to accomplish all that our God desires of us. The wording of these verses tells us that 100% reward is immediately accredited to our account of every redeemed saint at the time of salvation. Also, the enabling 
necessary to live or the power necessary to live that life as to keep the entire reward is given as a gift from our Heavenly Father. And rather than gaining or earning a reward, we need only to maintain what he has given us. You see, after we get saved, we still are a little mixed up until we learn some of the scriptures about uh, how, do, how do I keep my salvation? And what if I sin again? Well, the thing of it is, is that you don't keep your salvation. God does. He says he keep, by his power, he keeps us until the day of redemption. That's, that's, that's put your mind at ease. That gives a rest to your heart, your troubled heart. God will just keep you by his own power. But he is still is expecting us to yield our bodily members as servants under righteousness and not unto sin. So the expectation is that uh, we're going to maintain what God has given us. We don't earn rewards because of maintaining. If the rewards are already ours, we can just lose rewards by being disobedient. Before we were saved, most of us were taught to think of eternal life as something to be earned. That's what we figured. Well, if I go to church enough, God will think that's great. Check those things off and, and I'll, I'll be accepted. Or, you know, if I, if I clean my life up, you know, turn over a new leaf. And people have all kinds of vain imaginations about salvation, what it really is. But when the light of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ enlightened us to the truth... That salvation is in him, not in the church. Salvation is in the Lord Jesus Christ, not in me. Salvation is the gift of God. I can't earn it. When, when that glorious gospel is shown unto us through the scriptures, we happily learned uh, that the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord, according to Romans chapter 6, verse 23. But since we were saved, since the time of salvation, mine was back in September of... 1975, so that's, that's 25 and 20, that's 45 years, almost 46 years I've been saved. Uh, since I've been saved, well, all of us who've been saved, many of us have been taught to believe that the gifts of God are also earned, but they're not. When in fact, we're given everything right up front, and it's up to us to maintain it. It's up to us to live in a way so that we don't lose a reward. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 2, 3, and 4. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. He's given us all the things that pertain unto life and godliness. He didn't wait till you know, he, he was watching us to see if we were going to live better. Or gonna, we, were gonna, we weren't going to do some of the stupid things we did before we got saved. Uh, or the bad things that we did before we got saved. He, he gave us everything that pertains unto life and godliness right, right up front. With the, with the forgiveness of sins, he gave us everything right up front. Through the knowledge of him that called us to glory and virtue. See, he called us to glory and he called us to virtue. Glory is yet to behold. When the Lord returns or we get we pass away in this life and we go to be with the Lord. Uh, but virtue is something that we are expected to develop right here on this earth. That's cleanliness. Virtue is honesty, clean, all the good things. Whereby, verse 4, are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these... Ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. See, we escaped the corruption that we were living in when we trusted Christ. We escaped the corruption that is in the world. And because of that, we, we were given victory from it. But then, you know, as we started, we were excited when we first got saved. Many people are. And then, you know, just life happens and they begin to just go back to the old ways. As the sow returns back to the mire and the dog returns to his vomit. Eh, not a good picture, but the Word of God actually teaches us not to give up or lose what was made ours at the moment of our new birth in the Lord Jesus Christ. So God's expectation is a lot higher than ours. You see, We were happy just to get our sins forgiven and, and get, the, uh, get eternal life, get to go to be with God. 
after we die. But you know, the, there's where the problem is with the church. You wonder why the churches today are powerless. Their influence has waned to basically zero or below. And many young people do not attend church any longer. That's rare. Unless they got all kinds of uh, singing going on and, you know, all, like the worldly things. They're bringing the worldly things and make it attractive to them. But what about a true walk with the Lord? Consider the Bible account in Luke chapter 15, that chapter about the prodigal son, the son who left, he took his inheritance from his father and he went off into a far country. All that belongs to him by birthright is given to him by his father, right? Right here, here's, here's your inheritance. He says, you know, you should take care of it. He departs to a far country and he squanders every penny, every penny, so much so that he's living in the hog pens eating from the husks that the farmer throws to feed the hogs. Picture that in your mind. This is how a lot of Christians uh, end up, because they fail to uh, yield to the Lord and walk in his way. When he repents, the, when the prodigal son finally repents, he returns to his father's house, to the one who, uh, this one who was considered dead is pronounced alive again, and he's welcomed with love by the father, He's given a ring, he's given a robe, he's given shoes and more, which he has not earned and did not deserve. You see, he squandered everything, but he comes home and his father clothes him again, feeds him again. And those are typical of the gifts that your heavenly father's love towards every repentant sinner who comes to him through Jesus Christ. And he reestablishes the relationship, but you see, it's never his part. It's never God's part. He's never moved away. It's you who have moved away. It's I who have moved away. And so we have to come back. Like Adam, we, we begin in a place of victory. <laughs> Look at Adam, placed in a perfectly pure world. And he started out just everything was right where it's supposed to be. Then he, God creates Eve from Adam and he puts them in the garden there, and you know the rest of the story, and, and that's why we have church today. <laughs> that's why we have to hear preaching like this to keep us on the straight and narrow way. So uh, over this series of lessons, and it will be a series of lessons, we're going to consider examples of men and women who began in a place uh, of rich blessing, and, but they fell from that very place, and we're going to examine the how and the why of their falls and learn, and learn the ways in which God enables those who love him to avoid those kind of failures. Maybe you failed and maybe you're just angry with yourself. You can get over that. You can get over that. I've been there, I know. Just repent, confess that to God and start walking uprightly. So we, we understand that like Adam, we begin that way of if Isaiah 53, verse 6 says, All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned everyone to his own way, there, there must have been a correct point from which was departed. If you turned out of the way, you, you must have been in the way. You must have been in the right place. But to turn out of the way. Likewise, the sheep in Luke chapter 15 began with the other sheep, but he decided he was going to wander off by himself. The coin of Luke 15 fell into the dust. It wasn't there to start. It fell into the dust. The prodigal son left his father's house. He was already in the father's house, but he left the father's house. And so you saw where all those things, Just study Luke chapter 15 for a while. Not to deny the sin nature or any of the doctrines connected to the sin nature, but the words of Romans chapter 7, verse number 9, are unmistakable for anybody with a sound mind. They say this, For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. So what Paul, the apostle who wrote that, is stating is that, you know, without the law, we don't know what sin is. Without God's law, we don't know what sin is. Just like without the laws of the road, we don't, you know, 
we wouldn't know that speeding, you know, you might get into an accident or uh, have to pay a hefty fine. But we know the law. We're taught the law before we're allowed to have a driver's license. So the same thing with the commandments of the Lord, and particularly, we'll, we'll narrow it down to the Ten Commandments there. Uh, and we know that we're supposed to love God, how we're supposed to love God. We know that we're supposed to honor our parents. We know that we're not supposed to steal or lie or covet. We know these things. We're not supposed to murder. So, so those are understandable things, easy to be understood. And yet, without that knowledge of the law... Who would know what was wrong and who would know what was right other than our consciences? So, uh, in this regard, we would benefit to ponder the words in Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 29. Lo, this only have I found, that God hath made man upright, but they have sought out many inventions. <laughs> yeah, initially God created Adam upright, and Adam was pleased to communicate with God as they walked through the garden there and tilling the garden, taking care of it, until they decided they were going to go against God. Yep. It is the power of God which makes each one who trusts Christ, a Savior, a new creature, immediately giving them a position of triumph, not their own, but that of Jesus himself. We're crucified with him. We're buried with him. We're risen with him. We're seated with him in heavenly places. We're quickened with him. We're, we're hid with him. Our life is hid with him. We have fellowship with him. We, we're going to appear with him in glory. And we shall reign with him. It's all about Jesus. And he's the one with the power. Too often, though, Christians will turn and go after the baser things, the things that are this, the children of darkness uh, enjoy doing. We don't want to do those things. Now, from such a place of glorious exaltation with Christ, we're given the following orders in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 14. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord, not in your own flesh. It's okay to exercise, but... <laughs> You know, cover your body. You don't have to expose your body to the world. They know what a person looks like. And people lust, both men and women. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. You know, the devil's real. He'll mess you up, if you don't, especially if you don't believe he's real. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness. Now notice, Take notice that we're not told to gain the victory, but to stand. Stand fast in the Lord. The victory should be seen as a, as a gift to be cherished and kept. Something that's been given to us as a possession. Not carelessly forsaken and discarded as old Esau had done with the, his birthright in Genesis chapter 25, verses 31 to 34. Remember Romans 8. Romans chapter 8 is a chapter depicting the victory obtained through Christ working in us. We have to allow him to work in us. How do we allow him to work in us? By reading his word, applying what is, is expected us to apply, and living joyfully in that truth. And this is what the expectation is. Now, verse 37 in... Uh, Romans chapter 8 says, Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Not we will be, or we could be, or we should be, or, you know, if we do the right thing at the right time, might be. No, it says we are more than conquerors through, our, through him that loved us. Who loved you? God. <laughs> he loved us before we first, he first loved us before we loved him. Right? 
It doesn't tell us to conquer, but to rejoice in having been made more than conquerors. That's the key. We're already victorious, but yet many of us have, you know, we've done things that don't deserve any praise at all. So what do we do? We need to repent, confess our faithlessness to God, and turn our back on the world and turn our face toward God, and he will receive us. He'll receive us again. He'll clean, clean us with his own blood. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. And I'm saying, confess not to a man, but unto God. He's the one that you've offended. He's the one that I've offended. Now, reading in Hebrews chapter 11 of the best and brightest from many ages ago, uh, these were included in Hebrews chapter 11, known as the roll call of faith. Uh, of these men and women selected by the Spirit of God, about whom it is said, having obtained a good report through faith, we ought to consider some of their sequels, what happened uh, in their lifetime afterwards, you know, like part two of their life. It's evident from the chapter that a single act of faith is in one's life may result in being included with such illustrious company. But however, it's just as well understood that such acts of faith don't guarantee a lifelong victory. We're going to look at some of these things. Hebrews chapter 11, verse number 7. By faith Noah, you remember Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world, and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. What a magnificent thing that God would choose this man, uh, uh, Noah, uh, and he was warned of God, that God warned him to build an ark, uh, because he was going to destroy the world. And he saved himself, his wife, and his three sons and their, and their wives. And that's what repopulated the world after the great flood. And so uh, he was warned of a God of things not seen as yet. Listen, we haven't seen heaven. We haven't seen the Lord Jesus Christ. But we're warned ahead of time about those things. And so it behooves us to believe the word of God. Now, as soon as we turn the page of his life at that point, he gets intoxicated after the floodwaters recede and they, they get out onto dry land. He gets drunk. And, and the outcome of his error is, is the shameful fall of one of his sons and a curse placed upon one of his grandsons. Hebrews 11, verse 8. By faith, Abraham... When he was called to go out into a place which he should have to receive for an inheritance, obey. Abraham had never seen the place where God was bringing him, but he received it as an inheritance because of what? He obeyed. See, obedience is, is the reward, is, is the door that opens up the reward of all of these blessings from the Lord. It says he went out not knowing whither he went. And yet the same man, Abraham, provokes his wife to lie and allows her to be in the arms of a stranger just to protect his own, his own skin. Genesis 12, verse 11 to 13, came to pass when he was come near to eat, enter into Egypt that he said unto Sarai, his wife, Behold now, I know that thou art a fair woman to look upon. His wife was beautiful. Therefore it shall come to pass when the Egyptians shall see thee that they shall say, this is his wife, and they will kill me, but they will save thee alive. Say, I pray thee, thou art my sister, that it may be well with me for thy sake, and my soul shall live because of thee. So he was concerned that he was going to be killed and his wife taken as a, you know, a gift for Pharaoh, whoever it was that he was involved with there. All right, so he lied a couple times. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 21 talks about Jacob. It says, By faith, Jacob, when he was a dying, blessed both the sons of Joseph. This verse calls to mind what Jacob had done 
in Genesis 27, verse 24, uh, when Isaac, his father, asked Jacob, his son, Art thou my very son Esau? And he said, I am. You see, he lied. He lied to his father. In fact, his, his mother uh, helped him put on the, the charade so that he would get the blessing. Now, in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 24, it says, By faith Moses. So these are all Old Testament Bible characters. By faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. And you'd have to understand the story about Moses. His mother had the child, and, and the Egyptians uh, were, were telling the Israelites to kill all the male childs that were born, throw them in the river, and uh, put them to death. But uh, Moses' mother put him in a bulrushes and sent him out, and Pharaoh's daughter got a hold of him. And, and the whole story is an amazing uh, act of God's salvation. Uh, for this nation. So it says, By faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God, the Israelites, than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. So the Jews are to inherit a earthly kingdom, but born-again Christians, both Jew and Gentile, are going to inherit the kingdom of God, which is totally different than an earthly kingdom. And yet, for some reasons, uh, there's somebody, some might consider just, and others would, would say they were wrong, he killed a man. So he killed an Egyptian. And he, he thought he did the right thing, but uh, he killed a man. He murdered someone. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 27 tells us, By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Have you seen God? I know some people make a comment that they've seen God. Uh, but the fact remains is that God is a spirit. You can't see him. But Jesus is coming back and you'll see him. Uh, by faith he forsook seeing him who is invisible. Through faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch, should touch them. And of the same man it is written in Psalm 106, verse 33, that he spake unadvisedly with his lips. So sins can be anything from just saying the wrong things, saying things selfishly or foolishly. Uh, sins can range anywhere from murder to... Uh, just disobeying God. Hebrews 11.30 says, By faith the walls of Jericho fell, fell down after they were compassed about seven days. Shortly afterwards, this same company of Hebrews met the Gibeonites, and, and the men took of their victuals and, and asked not counsel at the mouth of the Lord of whether they were enemies or they were friendly. God told them to go in and just clear out the place. Just get rid of everybody. And they didn't follow through. And then it goes on, the list goes on. Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, Hebrews 11.32. Four names of honor and distinction. Providing you uh, overlook one made a statue to worship. Another showed cowardice in battle. One involved with sexual follies. Another was involved with brutality and the killing of a daughter. Verse 32 continues on in Hebrews chapter 11, to say of David also, this man will occupy most of our study in the lessons that follow here. The Holy Spirit records him in 1 Kings 15 verse 5, because David did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord and turned not aside from anything that he commanded him all the days of his life, well, save only in the matter of Uriah the Hittite. And there's, there's where one of the major problems in David's life that haunted him really the rest of his life. So we begin this way for two reasons. First, we, we have a hope of heaven only because we are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that's in Christ Jesus. That's the only reason, not because you're a good person, because God's a good, good being. He, he, he's good and he's long-suffering and he's tender-hearted towards us. 
but we need to repent and obey. That's, that's what he expects of us. You expect that of your own children. There would be no salvation, for, but for the fact in Isaiah 53, verse 6, all we like sheep have gone astray, we've turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him, Jesus Christ, the iniquity of us all. Jesus Christ on that cross, he bore all our sins in his body. It was bad enough that the nails pierced his hands and his feet and the sword in his side and the crown of thorns on his head. But I tell you, it was almost, it was completely unbearable for him to bear all our sins in his body. The sinless Lamb of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, bore all of our sins upon himself. You see, he's worthy to be believed. He's worthy to be trusted. He's worthy to have your faith in him alone because he's done all of these things because he loved us. Secondly, that we might comprehend that the best of men and the best of women are just wretched. Romans 7, 24, Paul, Paul bemoans, O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I tell you, with desperate hearts, Jeremiah 17, verse 9, tells us the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? God knows it. God knows all about us. He knows things that we've forgotten about ourselves. But I will tell you that God is merciful. Our God is, is not uh, a God who hates. He hates sin, but he he did all things necessary for you to have forgiveness of all your sins. And not only that, give you the gift of eternal life. And not only that, give you power to live a victorious life until the day he calls us home. Amen? I hope you understand. I hope you believe it. If not, listen to the message again. And I will tell you, we'll continue with these lessons. I praise the Lord for men that God has given ability to uh, put together the Word of God in a way it can be understood. And may you learn a lot from these lessons to come. And we praise the Lord for it. And we look forward to seeing you again the next time. God bless you. Have a great day. Have a great eternity.